Welcome to Brother Miller's Notes. So glad you're with me as today we study Matthew chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, and Luke chapter 3. Here's where I'm headed. We're going to talk about Christ's example, how Christ's example makes life easier, and along the same lines, how baptismal covenants make life easier. Really, the theme of the entire lesson today is, do you want an easier life? And so, that's where we're headed. Now, the book of Mark, a little bit of history behind that, introduction to it. Mark, he's also called John Mark. He's the author of this book. Although Mark was not among the original disciples of Jesus Christ, he later converts and becomes an assistant to the Apostle Peter. And that's where we get the Apostle Peter tradition that he learns these things from Peter, who's Peter's first hand, and that's how his background for the book of Mark. Mark and his mother, named Mary, lived in Jerusalem. Their home was a gathering place for some of the earliest Christians. Mark left Jerusalem to help Barnabas and Saul, or Paul, on their first missionary journey. Paul later wrote that Mark was with him in Rome and praised Mark as a companion who was profitable for him for the ministry. Peter refers to him as, quote, Marcus, my son, close relationship, suggesting, well, I write, that's written there, their close relationship. For Mark, for me, he helps us to see Jesus Christ as Christ walks the road to Palestine, heals the sick, causes the blind to see, and raising the dead. Today's study, we're going to focus a little bit on John the Baptist. You can see in Matthew 3, Mark 1, and Luke 3, the focus we start off with is John, John's preaching, and the baptism of Jesus Christ. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all see this, mostly the same events, maybe from a little bit different perspectives. That seeing things together has given, been given a label. It's called synoptic. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is because they include same the same stories, offler, often similar sequence, and in sometimes similar or identical wording. The term synoptic means, quote, seeing with the same eye. Each of these authors will share the events, but they have a different perspective uh, and maybe a different emphasis. And it's really fun to see the flavor that they give to an event where Luke is a doctor. He's just a little bit more on the, not medical, but hey, physical healings, the body, kind of sees it as a doctor would. And his audience is different. He's a Gentile, right? He's a Gentiles. And so you start to see that. So starting off in Luke, I'm going to, so I'm going to bounce back and forth between Luke 3, Matthew 3, and Mark 1. So I'll start off with Matthew, Luke 3, verse 4. And as written in the book, the words of Esaias, the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. John the Baptist teaches that Christ is going to come. And he's appealing to what's written in the books of the prophets. John the Baptist teaches this. He teaches that Christ will come and take away the sins of the world. John is teaching that Christ brings salvation to the heathen nations. John teaches that Christ's mission is to gather people who are lost, who are part of the sheepfold of Israel, he is gathering the dispersed, the afflicted. John is out there teaching. He is to prepare the way. And he's trying to make it possible for the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles. He taught that Christ is going to be a light to everybody who sit in darkness, to the uttermost parts of the earth. His focus is Christ. It's through Christ that the resurrection of the dead is going to happen. He teaches, prophesies, Christ will ascend on high. He is going to dwell on the right hand of the Father until the fullness of times. And the law and the testimony is going to be sealed. What Christ is teaching is true. And the keys of the kingdom, which Christ has, he will deliver up to his Father. He teaches that Christ will administer justice to everyone. And Christ will judge everyone. He's also there to convince the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they've committed. Now, that whole list is simply Joe Smith's translation of Luke chapter 3, verses 5 through 9, put in bullet format. And I just love what the Joe Smith translation does to teach us. Here's what John is teaching about Jesus Christ, what he's testifying. And you can imagine John teaching this out in the wilderness to everyone who will listen, and Christ 
because it's his cousin, knows about John the Baptist. John testifies this, chapter, Matthew 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Now, this word baptism, Greek, duop, is immersion. It's through immersion. That's what I'm doing. I have the Aaronic Priesthood, baptism through immersion to repentance. But he, probably should be capitalized, that cometh after me is mightier than I am, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He has a higher baptism. I'm doing it with water for repentance. He has the authority to baptize with the Holy Ghost and with fire, a cleansing. Sometimes, if students don't bring it up, and maybe I'm, right now I'm a little bit younger group, but I'll ask them, why did Christ need to be baptized? And many of us turn to 2 Nephi 32, but maybe here's an analogy, because Christ is pure. And maybe think about a bar of soap. And I will pull out a bar of soap sometimes in the classroom. Okay, why would you wash this bar of soap? And everyone's like, uh, well, you don't need to, it's clean. Well, isn't Christ clean? He's sinless. So why would you wash a bar of soap? And I let them kind of give the answers. Okay, if Christ is clean, why does he need to be baptized? So John is really, he starts to ask this question as Christ comes to him, why do you need to be baptized? And so I just kind of let them know, and we turn 2 Nephi 32, and we talk about some of those great scriptures that say, here's why Christ needed to be baptized. John knows that Christ is going to baptize with a cleansing agent like soap. But the, probably the more important question is not why Christ was baptized. It's why do I need to be baptized? Why do I need to be baptized for repentance with water? Why do I need to be baptized immersed in the Spirit and have that baptism of cleansing fire in my life? And what does it do for me? Elder Bednar said this that may help as you know, as maybe you have a discussion with this with your family. We are commanded and instructed. So to live our fallen nature is changed through the sanctifying power of the Holy Ghost. President Mary G. Romney taught that the baptism of fire by the Holy Ghost converts us from carnality to spirituality. It cleanses, heals, and purifies the soul. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, repentance, and water baptism are all preliminary and prerequisite to it. But the baptism of fire is consummation. To receive this baptism of fire is to have one's garments washed in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. Hence, we are born again and strive always to have His Spirit to be with us. The Holy Ghost sanctifies and refines our souls as if by fire. Ultimately, we are to stand spotless before God. So you think about that baptism of water, baptism of fire, how it blesses me. Maybe a related question is, just something to think about, How's my or how's your baptismal covenants blessed you? And I will pause and just talk about how covenants bless, how covenants bind us, keep us closer, help us to come unto Christ. I love what President Nelson has taught about covenants and the importance of them and how they bless each and every one of us. President Nelson has said, making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. And I love that as a theme for this whole lesson. Why do we get baptized? To make life easier. Why do we make a covenant with Christ? It makes life easier. President Nelson continu continues, Each person who makes covenants in baptismal fonts and in temples and keeps them has increased access to the power of Jesus Christ. Please ponder that stunning truth. The reward for keeping covenants with God is heavenly power power that strengthens us to withstand our trials, temptations, and heartaches better. This power eases our way. Those who live the higher laws of Jesus Christ have access to His higher power. Thus, covenant keepers are entitled to a special kind of rest that comes, through them, comes to them through their covenantal relationship with Christ. So, just going back, I would probably ask the same question, I mean, if I'm teaching this again, how does your baptismal covenant help your life be easier? So Matthew chapter 3, 
verse 13. Read 13 to 17. Then come Jesus from Galilee to Jordan, unto John, to be baptized of him. But John forbade it, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee. I want that cleansing baptism. I want that baptism of the Spirit. And thou comest to me. Hey, Christ, you're like soap. You're clean. Why are you coming to me? And Jesus answered, verse 15, and said unto him, Suffer it, allow it to be so now. For thus it becometh to fulfill all righteousness. One of the reasons why, and 2 Nephi 32 builds on that. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when baptized, went straightway up out of the water, or straight out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. But the doctrine in verses 16 and 17 is just so wonderful to kind of ponder. And I'll ask, because I'll spend a little more time on these verses. I mean, just think. Somebody, you and your friends, just say, how do you know that God the Father and Jesus Christ are two people? You could use those verses, and we probably, most of us have, to teach that. And... I'd ask if I'm teaching this like in a, in a seminary or, or Sunday school, hey, what are the scriptures? What are great cross-references? I love what the Joseph Smith translation adds to this. Verse 43, And Jesus answering, saith unto him, Suffer me to be baptized of thee, for thus it becometh to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And John went down into the water and baptized him. And Jesus was baptized. When Jesus, and when Jesus, sorry, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, because it's immersion, and John saw, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon Jesus. And he hears a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, whom I well pleased. Hear ye him. Prophet Joseph Smith taught a great clarifying truth about verse 45. He explained that the Holy Ghost did not appear as a dove after the baptism of Jesus Christ. Rather, the descending dove signified the Holy Ghost was present on that occasion. The third member of the Godhead was there, just like the Father. You hear the, hear the voice, this is my beloved Son. Here's what Joseph Smith taught. Quote, the sign of the dove was instituted before the creation of the world, a witness for the Holy Ghost. And the devil cannot come in the sign of a dove. The Holy Ghost is a personage and is in the form of a personage. It does not confine itself to the form of a dove, but in the sign of the dove. The Holy Ghost cannot be transformed into a dove, but the sign of a dove was given to John to signify the truth of the deed, as a dove is an emblem or token of truth and innocence. Now, I skipped over verses 1 and 2 of Luke chapter 3, and this is just like your two or three minutes of history time. So you get lots of names and lots of people described in verses 1 and 2, and then skipping to verses 19 and 20. So 15th year, of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate. So we'll talk about the 15th year in a minute. We'll talk about Pontius Pilate in a minute. We'll talk about Herod, the Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Idria and the region of Trachonitis, and Lysanus, the Tetrarch. Oh, wait, look at all these people, right? And verse 19, Herod, and Herod's brother Philip, and Herod's brother Philip's wife, Herodias. Okay, here's all these people, just to make sure we, I can keep them straight for me. The 15th year of Tiberius, that's going to be about 27 to 29 AD. Tiberius comes into power in 14 AD, after the death of Augustus, we even know the date, August 19th. And the year seems to be 29 AD. There are different ways people look at that, different calendars, but generally people agree this is AD 29. Some people use 27. I'm not caught up in it. I'm not a good enough guru to know. Pontius Pilate. He's usually called the governor of Judea. In the King James Version, his actual title is a prefect. Now, the prefect in Roman, kind of, their responsibilities are threefold. First, they're there to keep the peace. You don't keep the peace, you don't keep your job. And that is kind of paramount to understand about Pontius Pilate because it motivates him quite a bit. He controls the soldiers. They function as the police. Second thing a prefect does, they're a judge. That's illustrated in the case with Jesus. He's being a judge of Jesus. Third, 
thing he does, responsibility, is the care for the economic interests of Rome and Judea, including collecting taxes. And sometimes, if there's peace and the money's coming in through taxes, Rome usually doesn't care too much, especially if their money's coming in. Herod, uh, that's described here, is Herod Antipas. He's the second son of Herod the Great. That's the one that does the, the killing of the babies, Matthew chapter 1. He's not born earlier than 20 B.C. And is about 15 or 16 when his father, Herod the Great, dies in 4 B.C. And Antipas becomes Tetrarch. It's Antipas who arrests John the Baptist after John the Baptist criticizes him for convincing his half-brother's wife, Herodias, to leave Philip and marry him. Now, let's talk about Herodias. Okay, we know quite a bit about this woman. She's born to Aristobulus, the son of Herod the Great, and to Bernice. That's Herod's niece. When's, when she's a child, she's betrothed, that's the strong contract engagement, to Herod's son, who's also named Herod. That's just to make it confusing for us. Her only known child's daughter named Simone. Herodias accepts a proposal of a marriage from Herod Antipas, a cousin. Only technicality on that. She's already married. She's married. Someone else, hey, do you want to marry me? Yes, even while she's married. And then she goes and marries somebody else. She's ambitious. She pushes her husband, second husband, Antipas, who's a tetrarch. He's got a little territory. Okay. Um, she pushes him. And she marries when she's about 40 years of age. And all, what she wants is she's pushing to get seek royal privileges from the new emperor, Gaius. Gaius is the emperor of Rome, 37 AD. That request fails because of some treachery. She goes in exile into France and to Gaul with Antipas. She's jealous, she's ambitious, and that's her character. And you get that character woven in with Mark's description of her plot to have John the Baptist executed. Jealous, ambitious, power hungry. Okay? And that's from Brother Brown's uh, book, The Testimony of Luke. I've been throwing around this term tetrarch. Literally means that is a ruler of fourth part. So after the death of Herod in 4 AD, the Roman emperor thinks, okay, this is too big. I'm going to divide it into four different kingdoms. Okay, and then going to break it up. And the kingdom uh, kind of broke it in four, except for the governorship of Pilate, who's over Judea, Samaria, and Idumea, which belong, begins in AD 26. The territories that Luke mentions here are all the northern part of the region. So from 4 BC to 39 AD, Herod Antipas governs the area that's on the west side of the Sea of Galilee, as well as a strip of land that lies on the bank of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea called Perea. Galilee, a couple more terms. That territory lies west of the Sea of Galilee, includes the important period, uh, important city of Seraphis, whose remains stand about three miles north of Nazareth. But Antipas's little quarter part Tetrarchy does not reach the Mediterranean coast. And last couple people, Brother Philip, third son of Herod the Great, great and half-brother Antipas. Philip governs from 4 BC to about 33 or 34 AD, the territory to the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee and Mount Hermon. That includes Caesarea Philippi, which he founds at once is one of the great sources of the Jordan River. And Lysanus mentions only here that man governs a region northwest of the Mount of uh, Mount Hermon. So all this on a map. This is the kingdom of Herod, 4 BC. This is how it's kind of broken up. So you have the Sea of Galilee right here. We're going to get a lot of Christ's life. You can see where my cursor's uh, going around. Um, and then you have following the Jordan River down, Dead Sea, here's Jerusalem. So if you're going to Jerusalem up to Galilee, you're going from Herod Antipas's region right here into a different region, one of those different broken up parts of Herod the Great's kingdom. So when you go from here, going up somewhere different, and a little bit of friction here, you go over to Herod Philip's area over in this one, where Caesarea Philippi is. You'll start to get little bits of pieces of all these rulers. Thanks for just letting me point a couple of them out, who they are, who the major players are. 
Also, let me give you two teaching, teaching thoughts, and then I'll add one more thing. Um, this whole lesson for me is how to make life easier. How do your baptismal covenants make life easier? How does the gift of the Holy Ghost make life easier? How's Christ's example made life easier for you? Really, and I'm keying off of one quote from President Nielsen. Making and keeping covenants actually makes life easier. That's my focus as, as I, as I uh, teach this. And for me, this is a very simplistic lesson. How does make life easier? So how does making and keeping covenants make life easier for you? I did skip some things. In Mark chapter 1, it does talk about uh, Christ going out, calling the disciples, which is Matthew chapter 4 and Luke 5 that we'll study next week. So I kind of skipped that because that's the full next week's study. Hey, thanks for spending a little time with me today as we studied Matthew chapter 3, Mark 1, and Luke 3. Have a lovely day. Keep smiling.